Let's start with a question, Tim. Do you ever use Velcro in your life? Uh, pretty much all the time, Kurt. Yeah. Why, why do you ask? Well, do you know how the idea for Velcro came about? I think I'm supposed to say that I sort of do, but I sort of don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm guessing that you probably have done some research or you wrote about this and you're going to, you're j just tell me, just tell me. Okay? Ah, Tim, you are always so perceptive, always so perceptive <laughs> on this. All right. So in 1941, go way back to the, the world in 1941, Jorge's de Mestral was taking his dog for a walk through the woods. And upon returning home, Demestral noticed that the dog was covered in burrs, mm. those thorny, sticky oh. things that, you know, you try to pull apart, get off your pant legs, or in this case, get off of the dog's fur, and you can't do it because they just stick and they're, they're so clingy, right? So Demestral was an amateur inventor, and he was just curious by nature. So he examined those burrs that he found on his dog underneath a microscope. And what he saw there intrigued him, and it inspired him so much that he would spend the next 14 years attempting to duplicate what he saw under the microscope before introducing Velcro to the world oh. in 1955. That is a truly fascinating story, I, I have to admit. that. I just have to ask, though, does this somehow tie into our guest in this episode? Oh, it <laughs> does. It does. Okay. But, okay, but, good. but, before what? we go there, Tim, before oh. we go there, oh, I want to welcome our listeners to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores human behavior through a behavioral science lens. I'm Kurt Nelson, and you are... Tim Houlihan, <laughs> and we like to explore why we do what we do with researchers, authors, and practitioners in a conversational setting in order to bring their insights to you. And our conversation today, we met up with our dear friend, Sam Tatum, the author of a fantastic new book called Evolutionary Ideas, Unlocking Ancient Innovation to Solve Tomorrow's Challenges. It's a terrific book with a simple and clever thesis. Your super cool idea has probably already been thought of before, or as in D. Mestrel's case, exists somewhere out there in the wild in a burr or a bird wow. or a fish or a whale somewhere out there. It's already there. And this is not to bum you out, by the way, but it's to open up a whole new line of innovative thinking that you may be overlooking, like nature mm, like birds and whales and birds right so for your next design idea consider looking into the natural world do some biomimicry and why would you do that well sam explains of, of course so, so biomimicry is a is a really fascinating field that borrows from evolved biological solutions to help solve distinctively human problems so the assumption is that anything around in nature today has survived sort of 3.8 billion years of, of research and development. There's got to be something good about it. Sam goes on to point out terrific examples of biomimicry and the importance of language when it comes to innovating new ideas. He also introduced us to a concept developed by a Russian scientist from the Stalin era. Again, going back to those 1940s, right? There you go. An idea that creates a theory around problem solving called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z. Triz has 40 patterns of solutions or concepts called inventive principles, and that can help innovators apply ideas that have already been invented to help them solve their problems. So one example is the concept of nested doll. I think it's number seven. If you imagine the classic Russian nested doll, there's a, a suite of engineering solutions just like this, like a nail polish has its brush that goes in the bottle, that's a, that's a nested doll. If you have a retractable tape measure, that's an example of a nested doll. If you have a, a camera lens um, that you can ex extend and retract, that's a, that's a good example of a nested doll solution. Okay, you get the idea. This is a very entertaining and a very insightful conversation with Sam, and we hope that you enjoy it. So with that, we encourage you to sit back with a tall glass of ice cold natural biomimicry and enjoy our conversation with Sam Taylor. Sam Tatum, welcome back to Behavioral Grooves. 
Tim and Kurt, it's wonderful to speak again. Thanks for having me. We are excited to have you back. And this is an exciting time because you got a new book. And so we're going to be able to talk about that book. But before we get to talk about the book, we have to go through our speed round questions. So here we go. <laughs> and, and the last time, you, I think we asked you coffee and tea and you came up with some oh. fancy thing like white coffee, white flat, some, I don't know, some some Aussie kind of thing that was there. The there flat white. Like, oh, yeah. Here we go. I forgot this. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this time I'm going to ask a different question. So, all right. Yeah. Pubs in London or in Sydney, which are better? Oh, very different. Very different. Pubs in London, cozy, homely, crackling fire. Pubs in Sydney are open, sunny. Oh, pubs in London. Pubs in London. I have to say that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. You, you okay. might have just pissed off, pissed yeah. off a whole bunch of people here, but that's <laughs> pubs okay. In London. All right. Okay. And I don't remember if we talked about this, uh, but dinner with your favorite musician or favorite athlete? Whoa. Dinner with my favorite musician. Yeah. Hmm. I have to say, if I have a side note, so my favourite musician is probably David Gray. And I remember I was very fortunate. We were off to Italy, and I and in Stansted Airport, I saw David Gray. And I went up, to, and I said, I'm really sorry, mate, but I'm such a fan. I'm such a fan. <laughs> uh, so, and my partner, she thought um, she thought it was some behavioural scientist she'd never heard of. And, and, and <laughs> oh. <laughs> she, she said, I, did, I have no idea who that. I thought it was just some behavioural scientist. But you know what? Behind me on the plane to Italy was David Gray. So on when we landed, we caught up. We had kids. It was just it's the most wonderful, life changing. So I've so I've not had dinner. I've not had dinner, but I have caught a flight to Genoa. There um, you with, go. With David Gray. So you had a conversation with him. It sounds like it wasn't just like hi. Bits and pieces. Fortunately, I used my my daughter, who's like super cute, one and a half at the time, just as a bit of bait, just to, so I'm not a complete psychopath. You know, and so I made <laughs> well sure done. I, I made sure I well carried done. her everywhere. And, yeah. um, but he was just, he just, just cool stuff. He, 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 these musicians, they do, they do wonderfully cool, fun things with their sunglasses. I just remember, anyway, it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. We were able to give him, <laughs> we'd been to, fortunately, we'd been to where he was traveling. So we were able to give him some tips as to restaurants and things like that. So that's so it's a bit, a bit of something, but yeah, that was a life changing trip. Oh, that Love is, that. that sounds wonderful. That would be cool Love too. That. So. Well, next time, you know, on the airplane, when you're eating your, your dinner, that prepackaged dinner, you can sit next to David and have that conversation at dinner. There you go. See, this was <laughs> yeah. on a podcast that I heard. All right. What does a canary in a coal mine have in common with Van Halen? Great question. <laughs> so now we're moving into elements of the book, which is wonderful. And so really both are signals. Both are, are great signals of, of trustworthiness. And for the canary, fascinating. And this is something I learned researching for the book. The canary has a, an amazing sort of, it's evolved biologically to have basically get a double dose of air every time it breathes. It's, it's, um, it's typically it sort of originates from higher altitude areas. So it needs to sort of double dose its oxygen. Um, but because of this, actually, it can be a really helpful warning signal for poisonous gas. And because of its size and because of its sort of effective double dosing of the air around it, if there's something poisonous, the canary is typically the one to go down first. So it's been used in mines past as a really valuable signal of unobservable characteristics of an environment. And the same thing occurred for, for Van Halen, although it's sort of not a naturally evolved solution. It's a biological <laughs> no. solution. They bred their own canary, right? So Van Halen to ensure the, the trustworthiness of the production team setting up their performances and tuning their guitars, they created on their rider, which is sort of the contract for the production team, a contract, um, the, a sort of a no brown M&Ms clause. So they asked for a bowl of M&Ms to be in their, in their green room with all the brown M&Ms picked out of it. So they knew if they, if they went backstage, if there was a bowl of M&Ms with brown M&Ms, then they had reason to check everything else in the lineup. If you've got brown M&Ms, then there's a high chance that that guitar that's meant to be a, an A minor is actually a, a B flat. <laughs> Both are, are wonderful signals to help us to see unobservable traits ar around us. I thought it was going to be David Lee Roth and, you know, had eaten a canary at one point, kind of like uh, Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> had, had done. There is that. An Ozzy Osbourne in there somewhere. Yeah, there's, there's a bat. You know, but that's a much better story that you told. There you go. There's, so. a, there's a bats and Ozzy story, I'm sure, that needs to be woven in there somewhere. <laughs> I have to, I just have to ask. I, 
I always knew about the canary in the coal mine. I shouldn't say always, but for many years, I've known about the canary in the coal mine, but had no idea about the origin of it. And this double dose of oxygen was fascinating. Yeah. This idea that it's because they're ingesting oxygen faster at a higher rate is what kind of makes them more susceptible. I found it fascinating. Uh, similarly, I, I, I knew about the canary in the coal mine, but I, and, and, but I didn't realize why. They were such an effective bird <laughs> for, for that for that yeah. outcome. Not just sort of yeah. as far, you couldn't necessarily just take a mouse down there. So yeah, again, and, and this is a wonderful element of, of sitting down and looking to research something like a, a book. Is you're you're really forced to go deep in some things that I'd not explored before. It was wonderful. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, we are plowing through the speed round right now, and with our last speed round question, will hearing a scratch at the end of a song make you? think less of the entire song. Hearing a scratch at the end of song can make us think less of the entire experience, which is an interesting conundrum. It's a, it's a Daniel Kahneman con conundrum. It's sort of imagine that you're sitting there listening to minutes of orchestral glory on a gramophone and someone comes and scratches the scratches the, the disc. We assume or we often say this ruined the entire experience, but in actual fact, we we're blissfully enjoying the first few minutes. I mean, so we had the enjoyment. The enjoyment was in the can. What does influence us is our memory of the experience. So Kahneman speaks to this as the difference between our experiencing self, so the, the self that's enjoying every minute, every moment, and the remembering self. And in actual fact, when we look at what encourages people to attend a second time or what dictates the story, the narrative of our experience, it tends to be our remembering self more so than our experiencing self. Right. So we're taking this from the book, Evolutionary Ideas, and give us the evolutionary pitch on this. What about this particular tendency is important from an evolutionary perspective? With respect to remembering self? Yeah. And so there's a, there's a few things with respect to uh, the memory of whether or not a berry was poisonous or whether or not a certain patch of, of, of food is, is worth re revisiting. I think that's, that's the, the longer term sort of impact, I think, of the remembering self and the experiencing self. Um, but certainly we, we explore elements like the peak end effect, which is related. So we tend to evaluate experiences based on their peak, positive or negative, and, and how they tend to end. And, and similarly, these are sort of the moments that, that matter if it was a horrific experience or if it ended well. We can always have wonderful dinners that leave us sick. I mean, um, and we tend not to go back to that sushi restaurant or I, I, I ride in the book. I mean, there are, there are very few sort of endorsements of the first few nights aboard the Titanic. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter as much. That the first couple of meals were wonderful. Um, so, so, so this is where, this is where I think we can start to see what's the, what's the, the lasting impact on us that dictates whether or not we should attend again. And, and this remembering self, I think is really important, particularly as we think about, products and services and a variety of other things when we're thinking about how we design them and how we service our customers and all of those other factors, which I think is part of the, the aspect that I think really is interesting when we take these principles, as you've talked about, and kind of take these evolutionary elements around that and then apply them to ideas and apply them to, yeah. you know, what we're doing in our everyday lives, which is really interesting. You start the book off talking about about evolution, right? As obviously it's evolutionary ideas, but you talk about a concept called biomimicry. Can you tell our listeners just a little bit what that is and why that's important? Of, of course. So, so biomimicry is a really fascinating field that borrows from evolved biological solutions to help solve distinctively human problems. So the assumption is that anything around in nature today has survived sort of 3.8 billion years of, of research and development. Like, there's got to be something good about it. <laughs> yeah. Would think so. Yeah. You would think it's, I mean, <laughs> even if it's the smallest element, it's, it's, it's managed to survive. And, and those that, that haven't have sort of exited the gene pool. So when looking to solve challenges, actually, instead of starting from a blank slate or, or, or seeking to conjure something new, maybe we should look to nature to see how that's naturally been solved by evolutionary processes um, by which to address our own challenge. Um, so in the book I write about, I mean, and and actually stumbling across this story, we've sort of spoken off camera a, a bit that, that this is a this is a book that sort of there's lots of stories that have been collected over over years that sort of hopefully stitched together to tell a broader a broader narrative. But when I I was sent years ago a, a video on on the development of the Shinkansen 500, mm. which was the the Japanese speed train that had challenges with 
increasing their speed, not because of the speed, but because of the noise. And to address the, the noise challenges, actually, the, they borrowed from three birds, the owl, the penguin, and the kingfisher. And, and if I speak to the kingfisher specifically, uh, one of the challenges on the Shinkansen 500, it's a stretch of rail that connects Tokyo and Osaka, was a series of tunnels. As the train was going through at blistering speeds, it would create these tunnel booms, these sounds that was sort of over the regulation of Japan. Um, so instead of going back to the drawing board and and thinking, sort of looking deep into to physics in isolation, what the team did was actually borrow from the kingfisher, a, a bird that's perfectly evolved to go from the air into water, a substance that's 800 times denser than the air around it to skewer its prey. And they essentially just nicked <laughs> the, the, the bill of the kingfisher and whacked it on the front of the train and found that that was able to reduce the tunnel boom. And when I heard that story, I thought, well, that's that's sort of what we do from a psychological perspective. So biomimicry is really about borrowing from evolved biological solutions, whether it's learning from the blood flow of the hair to design an air conditioning system or the tubercles of a humpback whale to design more efficient wind turbines. Um, there, are, there are wonderful examples in nature that we can borrow from to accelerate our own processes. So that's, that's biomimicry. And, and for anyone who's not heard of it, I'd encourage a good exploration as to some of the wonderful innovations that are around sort of needles that are borrowing from the mosquito. <laughs> you know, in, uh, these are just wherever your brain can go, chances are there's something in the natural world that can accelerate that innovation. It's a great insight to uh, to challenge. Uh, and you, you talk about problem solvers in the book, right? You talk about, you know, problem solvers could use this kind of stuff. And I'm wondering if as you were doing research for the book, because you've certainly started with a foundation of experiences, observations, stories that, as you said, you've stitched together. Were there any that were like, wow, that's really, there's something really remarkable about that particular aspect of biomimicry, that that particular observation in nature played a really important role in the design of a, a product or a brand or or an experience? Uh, there's one example that I think, I mean, it's entirely branded on the the, the, the fact that it's a biomimicry solution. It's whale power. So a business, I think they're out of Canada. I mentioned it sort of fleetingly now, but if you look at the fins of a, of a humpback, they have a series of tubercles, so little bumps. And essentially this 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 business, clearly <laughs> mimicking <laughs> whales, I mean, it's, it, it's in the brand, um, they have found that they're able to produce turbines that maximize the lift and minimize drag to be more efficient simply from 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 borrowing sort of almost directly from, from the whale. Um, so that's a wonderful, really clean example. But there are, I mean, from if we look at the innovation of Velcro, it's a biomimicry solution mm-hmm. that's found. I forget the name of the gentleman actually, who found sort of spurs on his dog um, in his every sort of on his morning w- walk. That's that's often used as a lovely example of lateral creativity, um, where you sort of where the solution might be anywhere. Just like the sort of the Nike waffle shoe was was an innovation from the the waffle line one morning as he sort of sat down thinking how he can how Bill Bowman can help his runners sort of run 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 faster. The waffle might be sol- the the solution. So it's oftentimes we can see some of these in in lateral creative stimu- stimulus, but actually there's a whole field that's focused on on borrowing from these natural evolved solutions. Yeah. It's interesting because now you, you started with biomimicry and then you move into engineering. You move into the, a whole nother set of engineering rules and laws and, and bring up a whole th- something I had never heard of before, which was TRIZ, which is this what the theory of inventive problem solving originally brought forth by a Russian inventor who I will not even attempt to say his name because I will I will muff it up really really bad. But help us understand a this movement then over into this engineering process and what that is and how that works. So Triz, um, so Genrik Outschulder and I might have muffed that up too. But I'll I'll say the, the gentleman. The gentleman <laughs> he's, he's, he's passed away, so he's, the, yeah. he's, he won't he won't call up as a complaint. Triz was really important to build from biomimicry. So Triz is really about systematic problem solving. So, so Genrik uh, essentially was, a, as you, as you say, a, a Soviet inventor and so successful in his early career that he was sort of snapped up by the Russian Navy and put in the, Navy, the Naval Painted Office where he was sort of charged with supercharging the Russian Navy's approach to innovation. But in that role also he saw it was across many of the different patents that the Navy were, were, were producing and and. And what he found through this role and, and, and sort of his observation was that many of the problems that we were continuing to innovate for had already been solved in other fields. Mm. 
And actually, later, I think he and his colleagues looked at about 200,000 patents and really wow. found that yeah, so it's a huge, huge study and, and, and broke it down into sort of levels of inventiveness. So sort of there's 45%, and I'll, I'll, I'll mix up the statistics here, that really sort of is not an invention. <laughs> it's like making a wall. Yeah. It's like sort of akin to making a wall thicker to, to reduce sort of noise, and that's, that's, that's been done before. But really only, only, only 1% of the team classified as, as sort of moonshot innovation, as truly, truly, truly novel ideas. And this is important for the book for two reasons. One is that it helps us to sort of see that what might be a revolutionary mindset this sort of assumption that we need to create something new or novel to be effective. Actually, in actual fact, sort of, even if we think it might be novel, um, it's chances are it already exists somewhere. We've just not gone through the process of documenting it. So it's so so Tris is important in understanding actually there's there's a real dearth of real innov- innovation. And we can begin to map the solutions that are out there. So the second component as to why I think Tris is really important as a as a tool for this book is that for Tris. Alt Schuller identified about what, what he called sort of inventive principles. So these 40 patterns of solutions that he calls inventive principles based on this observation. So if we imagine a parallel with biology, we look at species and we dictate differences by the presence of a spinal cord or features on gills. In Alt Schuller's inventive principles, they sort of classified these solutions based on their, their engineering outcomes and technical components. So one example is the, the, the concept of nested doll, I think it's number seven. If you imagine the classic Russian nested doll, there's a, a suite of engineering solutions just like this, like a nail polish that has its brush that goes in the bottle, that's a, that's a nested doll. If you have a retractable tape measure, that's an example of a nested doll. If you have a, a camera lens um, that you can ex- extend and retract, that's a, that's a good example of a nested doll solution. So in TRIZ, they've mapped 40 of these inventive principles from like beforehand cushioning is another lovely one. Like having an airbag in your car, having tires around a track of an F1, having a parachute. Those are examples of beforehand cushioning. <laughs> yeah. Thinking, yeah. Of, thinking of the worst you know, in, in advance of what, what might be. Ideas like segmentation, like turning a couch into a piece of modular furniture or, or curtains into Venetian blinds. You know, those are both examples of segmentation. So it's, it's important because of this sort of pattern recognition quality of TRIZ. Uh, and the last, the last element, and then I'll, I'll stop for a moment, is sort of quite central to the TRIZ methodology in what innovation is. So Alt Schuller argues that innovation is the resolution of a contradiction. Mm-hmm. Um, so two things that sort of, how is this possible? If we can resolve that, if we can resolve this contradiction, that requires innovation. And the fun backstory to this actually is, I mentioned at an early age, I was snapped up by the Navy and 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 sent to the patent office. And what he did, what he did as a brazen young young lieutenant, is he wrote a letter to, to Stalin. He wrote a letter to Stalin and said, "Look, I, I see there's I see there are some issues with our innovation process, and I have a solution to help us to to take us to take us forward." And Which, of like, course, Stalin loved, right? I, he was he was he was just fan, happily re- greeted by that. He loves right? feedback, Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> the, old, the old sort of feedback. I really love what you're doing here, but there's a, the old feedback sandwich. No, so <laughs> so, 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 so following this, it's Stalin is in, essentially sent Alt Schulder to, to to labor camp where he was he was treated he was treated with with um with sleep deprivation, and he sort of had this conundrum: how can I how can I sleep, but but sort of appear to be awake as the guards walk past? So what he did was he fashioned sort of pupils from a cigarette packet and charred sort of eyeballs into the cigarette so that his cellmate put on his closed eyelids. So he looked like he was awake while he was actually asleep. And this is a lovely sort of resolution of a contradiction. How can I keep my eyes open and closed at the same time? Well, we can do that by innovating with a cigarette packet. And in Triz, they explore contradictions like, how can I make this bulletproof jacket heavy enough to stop a bullet, yet not so heavy that it's impossible to wear? Or how can I create something that's of this particular volume um, that can fit in this particular size, like an umbrella that covers the body but can can fit in a handbag? And that's where you start to look at innovation principles like nested doll. How do I increase the volume without increasing the the size or the shape? Well, nested doll can help us to do that. Um, So in, in TRIZ, they've developed a matrix. So essentially looking at what could cause a contradiction, whether it's increasing the speed, the weight, the size, the shape, the volume, without changing 
the speed, the size, the weight, the ease. Um, and if you look at that matrix, then you can essentially identify what's the inventive principle to help us to solve that. So in 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 close, I feel like I've gone on a long monologue here, <laughs> Tim Kirk. But TRIZ is really important for it, it helps us to see that while we might think and be driven for novelty and radical solutions, there's a that in, in actual fact, most of the problems have been solved before, certainly in the engineering world. There's a suite of observed patterns of inventive principles, just like segmentation, beforehand cushioning, nested doll that we can draw upon. And there's a systematic approach that we can deploy these in solving contradictions, like increasing the volume without a change in the size. And to help us to do that, if you look at the matrix, then nested doll is a pretty good place to start. Yeah. I love that you, like Lighty Klotz in, with his book, Subtract, you know, you've taken a very, a Triz takes sort of a counterintuitive look to say, Look, real innovation is very rare, but if you're looking to solve problems, there's already a lot of evidence in nature with biomimicry. Hmm. And one of the things that I, I love that you came back to several times is the book in the book is that you said this phrase, what we say we can see and what we can see we can apply. And I just like, that's like a meditation for me. <laughs> it's, like, it's, so, it's such a cool line. So could you, could you just tell us about the importance of that sentence? What, and I just want to say it again for listeners. What we can say, we can see. And what we can see, we can apply. Of, of course. Not. And it was, a, 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 again, a, a great realization for me through this, this, this process, which is always a learning process. And that line is, is really around language, how language can be a real liberator for our innovation. And in, in behavioral science, and it's really a, a book on, on behavioral science that learns from biomimicry and, and, and trees and engineering solutions, but we're often yeah. faced with defending the complexity of the language of behavioral science. And why do we need to say idiosyncratic fit instead of saying, well, someone might <laughs> just have a better chance of winning this? And because it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> and, and sometimes we can just be seen as sort of the, not to, to dissuade any of our <laughs> lawyer friends, but it just feels like we're sort of lawyering people out of like, don't touch, don't touch this. <laughs> you don't know the language. You're not. You can't play here. Yeah. But there's a lot of fascinating research on on language and how it helps us to to shape our perception, but also shape shape behavior. Because once we have a language for something, we can categorically see it and experience it faster and, and easier. So a lot of the studies conducted in this space have explored color, and color is a really interesting um, leveler, right? Because we all have the same sort of biological features with our eyes and our uh, how we see it within our within our brain. But the way we talk about color is different insofar as the languages that we that we use. And in, in Greek and, and Russian, for example, for the color blue, there are two sort of categorically different terms for light blue and dark blue. Whereas in English, they're still sort of categorically blue. One is lighter or one is darker. And when you look at people in a, in a brain scanner and you expose them to light blue and dark blue, what you find is that Russian and Greek participants sort of react with a more of a surprise response, it's like something is categorically different here. So the language used to define the same spectrum of light that we see helps us to see it faster. So for us, having a language to identify that that is a sunk cost or that is a social norm or this is a really wonderful sort of quantity anchor, that language can help us to see that there's something categorically different there that we should explore. Because a lot mm-hmm. of the language that we use, I think, in, in business can be quite blunt. I mean, I write in the book, how can Inuits have like 50 different words for snow? And we're still right. using what can be considered blunt languages like loyalty or surprise and delight. I mean, I just think there's there's a great excuse for a finer, richer language to help us explore that. Because once we have that language and we can embrace that language, then we see them as categorically different solutions, just like our light blue and dark blue uh, e- example. We can say, actually, well, that's, yeah, the outcome is loyalty, but the input is commitment or the input is sunk cost or the input is endowment and endowment is slightly different to just a loss aversive pro- so so you can start to you can start to really see the differences in in these evolved patterns of human behavior so just as triz has developed 40 different inventive principles the field of behavioral science the work of government and academia to sort of codify patterns of responses helps give us a, a, a rich starting point to, to interrogate our own innovation. Do you think, given given that Triz and, and you talked about the 40 inventive principles and there's the 39 engineering parameters that are kind of there, they've kind of quantified that down and really taken a good look at it. And one of the things that struck me as I was reading the book and kind of thinking about this was 
we have a whole bunch of behavioral biases that are being listed out there. But they're, they're not necessarily categorical like those, or they're, they're not kind of truncated down into the core components, the 40 that are going to be principal. Mm. Is that something that we as a field need to be thinking about doing? Do you think there's a, can it be done? Is that something that is even possible given how this is uh, the, the, the field of behavioral science and, and what we're researching? And, and B, is that then? something that we should be doing if it can be done? I think it can be done with with caveats. So if we look okay. at, and we, we'll be familiar with that wonderful Rolodex of behavioral biases. And yeah. um, I mean, it feels like, and again, again, one of the criticisms of our field is that it feels like there's a, a bias a minute. And I think there's a distinction to be made here in between what is, what is a, a sort of a fallibility of, of human behavior and what is something that we can, which which helps us to, Again, it's all about better understanding people and how they decide and, and act. But but there is a suite of of patterns of responses that are more and uh, are more aligned with problem solving. Mm-hmm. Um, so so we can, for example, we can look at social norm and say, well, it's really interesting that we tend to follow the crowd, and that could be considered a fallibility by some, but it's a pattern of, of evolved responses. Um, but we can also look at the flip side of saying, well, we can create norms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so actually, so it's, it, it's not just a, a sort of a bias in res- respect to our, how we respond. It's something that we can actively learn from and implement to encourage a desired behaviour. So, I think it's for me, and, and certainly for, for the book, it's around what are these elements of these these patterns of solutions that are that, that we can implement, rather than just there's this Texas sharpshooter fallacy that we tend to. <laughs> sort of, that, that's interesting. It helps us to know, but it doesn't doesn't give us a solution. So that's one part of that. And I think the second caveat, and I explore this at, at the at the end, is just the importance of context and individual differences mm-hmm. in dictating. I mean, this isn't this isn't it can't be a one size fits all solution. I was fortunate to have a, a wonderful conversation with Dalip Soman um, through the mm. production of the book, and Dalip had a great example of this, looking at manufacturing that I use in the book and he shared and he said, you can think about sort of manufacturing and fridges, for, for example, that you might mass produce them in one particular market and then export them to every other market. And by the time you sort of mass produced in the, in the US and by the time it gets to Australia, you realize, well, it doesn't fit the socket. <laughs> you know yeah. so, so you can centralize the production of the entire solution or you can distribute the raw ingredients. So send the raw components to each market and then build them sort of fit for, for, for each culture. And I really love that as a, as a sort of, a, again, another analogy for how this can work. We sort of have these components, but they need to be built within a culture and for a specific audience group. Um, but that's the other sort of, uh, I mentioned with sort of with, with caveats, I think there's, there's benefits in understanding universalities, but that can take us so far. But in the yeah. book, going back to Tim, your question on sort of what we say we can see and what we see we can apply. I use in the in the book the example of of language, just increasing efficiencies in obviously communicating and communicating ideas. And I use the example of the term banana, and everyone mm. you hear yes. banana, you hear banana, and it's it, it automatically conjures these rich associations of its texture, its shape, its color. So it's just a far more efficient way of navigating the world rather than saying that long, bent, slippery morning staple. I mean, that's just an inefficient, <laughs> yeah. an inefficient the yellow thing that you peel. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and as research has found, I think that a, a large proportion of people suffer from type 2 diabetes because they have these disparate symptoms that they've not been able to connect as, oh, that's, that's diabetes. So, so actually being able to use a more efficient language can help us be more efficient in our innovation. So I use the, hopefully it's not seen as a a sort of a throwaway comment, but if behavior change and innovation is like making a fruit salad, it's more efficient for us to say, shall we try the banana? Then Mm. shall we try the long, slippery morning? morning (laughs) So, so that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it will work in every culture and every context. But it's a far more efficient way to getting closer to the solution that can work. And if it does, we know have a better understanding as to why. And if it doesn't, we can sort of exit the breeding program. Yeah, I love that, Sam. Thank you for expounding on that because I think it's a it's a fantastic principle. I guess it's something that I believe deeply that the business world is is lacking in the general corporate will 
to be more specific, to use better words, you know, that, that it, everything gets caught up in acronyms and, you know, maximize that and take that to the limit and let's double down on this and all that kind of corporate double speak just pisses yeah. me off um, <laughs> on some level. But, uh, but, I, but I'm not here to rant. I, I want to actually. You just uh, did. That's okay, just, Tim. You just, you just ranted there. That's all right. You brought up the gold gradient theory, which was originally developed by Clark Hall and and then uh, revisited by Itamar Simonson and Ron Kivitz and his colleagues. And Kurt and I are kind of fans of that uh, as, it, as it plays out. But it's, it's a wonderful theory. And maybe you could just explain it real quickly about what gold gradient theory is and why it's so meaningful, to, especially to marketers. But my question is, why are really great tools like this not used more often? Is kind of my question. And so I'm, I'm interested in your opinion on that. But maybe you could start by just give us a little description of what goal gradient theory is. So, so the goal gradient is, is really sort of the, we become more motivated the, the closer we are to a design outcome. So to take it back a step, we tend to value later stage events um, more than earlier stage events. If we were to come out tomorrow and say Usain Bolt's going to run the second leg of, of the four by one hundred in the Olympics, we think, well, how? What's he doing on the, the second, leg? second leg? He needs to bring us home because later stage events tend to, to matter more for us. They're more changeable, <laughs> so we tend to prioritize those more. And so Clark Hall, as you mentioned, sort of discovered this with mice and found that actually in a in a maze task, the mice ran faster the closer they got to the end outcome. And we've seen similar responses in in humans, but not putting us through mazes, but putting us through loyalty <laughs> programs, for example. So if it's a classic sort of buy 10, get one free, we find that sort of purchase frequency tends to increase the closer we get to receiving that receiving that goal. So that's sort of goal, goal gradient. And there's some interesting things we can play in there too. It's called endowed progress. So actually we found that if you drop the mouse halfway in the, in the maze, I mean, they already get that sense, well, I'm already closer than, than when I started. So by boosting someone with, okay, it's a, it's a classic buy 10 coffees, get one free, but maybe I give you, I, I sort of pre-stamp one, I'm already on the journey, I'm already benefiting from that motivation to continue. So that's really about sort of goal grading. In the book, I sort of cover how this can be quite subtle in design cues and, and how we can embed this. Why is it not used more frequently? Uh, again, it goes it goes back to I think understanding uh, and and potentially back to our conversation around the language of goal gradient to see well this is essentially what we're trying to achieve here. How might we do this within the constraints that we have, and whether that's a postal service, whether that's BMW encouraging you to to complete a specific form for a test drive, or or wait patiently for your car to come back home from Munich. Uh, I think it's understanding that this is this is a, available to us that there is a meaningful difference for us to pre-stamp that that one coffee or to to identify mm-hmm. actually not just the stages that someone have ahead of them but the stages that they've gone through yeah. uh, bef- before they get here. Just to, you can in in a sense manufacture what's happened to you know if you're if you're looking at helping I'm riffing now but someone get through college you can say well actually you've You've done this many years of elementary school, this many years of high school, this many right, years of college. Right. You've got one more year. <laughs> You've got one more year. Yeah. And that's just finished. Just finished. Yeah. I mean, look at all this. I mean, it's, a, it's the equivalent of, of, of landing in Heathrow and saying, like, you've just traveled 17 hours to get here from Singapore. You're in, it's literally just 20 minutes and you have your bag. You're in rather than like, okay, now it's a 20 minute wait. So, yeah. different ways of, of, of framing mm-hmm. what's ahead of us. And I think once we can see the universality of some of these, and that's what's what gets me excited, and and the, the many instances of of this um, that we can see and, and and captured in the book across category, because that's what I think really important. That yes, we can see it in in coffee card loyalty programs, and I in the book that's an image of of a, of a cafe I used to visit, visit in in London that had a sort of as part of the production of their coffee loyalty cards they just pre-stamped the first. Um, so so they whether that's by design or or just or just intuition, I mean, they're, they're, they're doing it. But we can start to see the same thing in so many different contexts that we can borrow from those applications or borrow from those executions of goal gradient for, for the challenges of our own. Once we understand the problem that we're solving. Um, yeah. So in, in the book, for example, I, I speak to goal gradient in the psychological contradiction of, of boosting loyalty. So we, we mentioned before around these contradictions in TRIZ, how can we increase volume without increasing size? In the book, we explore five psychological contradictions, like how do we reinforce the truth without changing? How do we reinforce trust without changing the truth? 
How do we aid decisions without limiting choice, boost loyalty without increasing compensation, enhance experiences without changing their du- du- duration, trigger action without forcing a response? These are all sort of psychological contradictions. So to enhance loyalty, I've sort of explored goal gradient. And it's like, really, how do we get someone to complete? How do we get someone to continue to stay with us? Well, making them feel like they're on the journey, making them feel like they're closer to the outcome, we can achieve this. I like how you talk about the universality of these components, right? And the, the idea that if we can come back to some of these universal truths that are on the, on the general Organizational aspect of this, not that specific piece, that then we can start thinking about applying these more like Triz is being applied. And, and you're thinking about, all right, so here's the problem. Now we know that the problem, let's identify what are the general principles that we can apply to this in order to solve it in, in a better way. And, and where do you see this going? I mean, do you you obviously came up with those five contradictions, which I loved, and actually I'm glad you talked about that because that was one of the questions that we skipped over <laughs> at the beginning of here that we, we didn't get to. So I'm glad you came back to that. But are, are there more contradictions that we need to look at? Is there a list of 39 general you know principles that we overlay from this piece going forward? I think it's certainly, po- I mean, there are, there are other contradictions we explore a little bit, sort of increasing value without changing the price. That's, yeah. a, that's another lovely, lovely, lovely sort of contradiction. And I think we can get um, more nuanced and more specific. So I, 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 this is this is very much in my eyes the, the tip of the iceberg and the most broadly applicable way of explaining the breadth of, of the world of behavioral science and evolutionary psychology to, to aid us. Um, but I think we can, we can certainly be more specific in but both sides of the contradiction um, equation. Uh, yeah. And this could be spending more time going within a category. There's a specific mm. element of patient adherence. That's yes, it's commitment, but it's it's more nuanced than that. Um, so I, I I certainly think we can we can um, we can go deeper. The one 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 of the reasons why I didn't want to uh, at this stage at least sort of more formally create a, a matrix or grid is that once we start to put things in boxes, it feels like it's very finite, and we can find and we can also find that there's there are principles that work across different contradictions yeah. uh, again, based on how it's deployed. So there's nuance. There's there's nuance there that's important to, to understand when we're deploying it. But I do think with respect to innovation, and we look at a lot of innovation in corporate society today, it can be like rolling the dice. Let's just get lots of programs going and 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 sort of I, I think Gary Pisano um, calls it in his HBR article sort of the shots on goal fallacy. The more shots we take, yeah. the more we'll win. Um, whereas this can help us to sort of hone in – where we should start. I mean, yeah. So it's a bit of sort of, it's a bit of focus uh, as we kick off our innovation process. But then once we have this focus and we say, well, actually there might be, if we're looking at decision-making, there might be sort of six different areas that we can explore. But those six different areas, if we're looking at an asymmetric decoy, which is a, a sort of tends to, uh, it's, a, it's always a fun one where you sort of add something of, of lesser value but equal price <laughs> to a mix I saw a great one yesterday. It was like looking at a mobile data plan and it was like 55 gigs for, for $30 or 50 gigs for $40. I was like, that's not even, you're not even trying oh. it, guys. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's that like wild. Um, but, we can, but you can start to see, okay, so asymmetric decoy is a potential lever to pull here. Where do we see that in the world around us? Because they're through design, through social learning, through intuition, through trial and error. We've adapted to do some of this stuff anyway. I mean, mm. and what's and it occurs across category, across industry. So if we if we start with let's say let's explore asymmetric decoy, there might be twenty examples of that in slightly nuanced fashions for for different providers. Whether that's telco, whether that's looking at Dan Ariely's famous economist example, whether it's I saw a, a, a lovely image of of a water fountain, a drink fountain that was like just boring looking water, really jazzy looking water or Pepsi. And it's like, well, <laughs> the jazzy, the jazzy looking water looks better than the boring looking water. So that's an asymmetric decoy and a sort of a visual, visual overlay. And and this is important. And we go back to biomimicry now because yeah. this is important. This, this is why language is important because it helps us to see that there's a pattern of solutions out there. And once we see these patterns, we can say, well, actually these, these examples are slightly different. They're not all the same, right? Just as putting 
any old beak on the front of the Shinkan Z500 wouldn't necessarily have. It was the specific evolved difference of that of that bird, right? right. Yeah, the Toucan beak wouldn't work. You exactly. know? It just, <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's not gonna it's not gonna cut it. But but it's, it's about these evolved differences. But at least we're looking at the right species. We can start saying, how can yeah. we look at birds? And then we go, okay, well, once we look at birds, there's something quite interesting here what they've done for this mobile program or there's something quite different in how they're asking people to sign up for their superannuation or to agree to a medical procedure there are these evolved differences that we can then deploy on on our own front yeah i love the idea of finding those patterns and and looking for as you said look it's already been invented or it's already been talked about and so now it's just the fact of identifying what we can transfer from point A over to point B. And we know in in behavioral science that context matters. And so we have to be, you know, it can't just take this and replicate it over here, but at least we can look for the general principles that are being applied and have, as you said, those shots on goal. Well, maybe we can we can now target those shots on goal to be in the upper left-hand corner of the goal, which we know is open as opposed to sending them right at that goalie, right? And so you're, you're going to have a better shot at making that and in, into something that's real. And Tim is itching. I can just tell he is itching <laughs> to ask you some question. I'm, I'm sure it isn't related to music at any, any point. Here. Well, actually I've been dying to ask this question and it, it's not music yet. We, and we only have a few minutes left, Sam, but I'm really curious if $20,000 landed in your lap first thing tomorrow morning, would you find yourself to be the proud owner of a 1960s VW? <laughs> I, I, might, I might do. I might do. That's a, so. So, so you, you bring that up as, a, as an example. Exactly what you're speaking to, Kurt. Once you start to see these patterns, it becomes an affliction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, write about, I write about the 1960s VW as sort of once you're. It's kind of an obscure car, just as if you're looking for a, a, a specific Fender or whatever. You and once your your brain is is into something, you find that you see them everywhere. Um, it's called the yeah. Meinhof phenomenon. Again, it's, so it's, it's also a part of our, an evolutionary process. It's we're all we're pattern recognizers. Yeah, um, yeah. Because randomness doesn't help us. Yeah. Um, so seeing patterns is the best way in which we can sort of start to um, navigate our way through the complexities of this world. And once we once we identify this exists, we, you, you find that I found certainly, and, and hopefully it comes through the book. It's a bit of an affliction that you can't not see them, whether you're on holidays or, or work. <laughs> you'll see these. You'll see these everywhere, just as you'll see now these 1960s VW driving on every corner because you've just decided to buy one. Hopefully now we'll start seeing. Well, okay, that that asymmetric decoy that Tatum was just rambling on about. I'll see that tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, see, that, it in, I'll see it in a menu at McDonald's. Not. Not in a not in a, um, a mobile phone carrier. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's around. Okay, so uh, qu- quickly to to music. I am curious that if if you found yourself stranded on a desert island for a year, heaven forbid for all the negative things, it might be fantastic. But what two musical artists would you take with you? Can I take Can I take bands? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. And their whole catalog. Not actually, not the people. You wouldn't actually like. You wouldn't take Oasis, but you would. You could take all their music. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. Good question. So I've because I've given already given David Gray such a big. I mean, I'd, I'd have to bring my friend yeah. David. I mean, we know it, we're pretty tight. We went to Italy. Yeah, you and yeah. you and David go <laughs> back. <laughs> we, I mean, we've already we've already done this, Tim. But anyway, let's play with your hypothetical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd probably take David. There's another band. It was some 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 Australian listeners. A band called Powderfinger. Ah, in Australia. I love Powderfinger. Have you ever come across Powderfinger? Yes. So I'd probably take a. I'm, I'm in Australia at the moment, actually. It's funny, I'm back on the radio station that I always used to listen to, and Powderfingers comes up every sort of fifth song, it seems. But so that's reigniting my love of, of Powderfinger. So I'd take David and the, and the yeah. band Powderfinger and their, and their backlogs, um, but, yeah. but they can come. They can come. All of them. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. I, I discovered Powderfinger when I was in Australia for the first time in early 2000s, and it was just like, I'm like, oh, these guys need to get airplay in the U S and yeah, yeah, yeah. they got maybe a, yeah, a, little. a little bit, but then, then it just, yeah, it, it hasn't, but I've, I've, I've loved them ever since. So, all right, Sam, I have one last question, non-musical question, right? Did you ever think when you were writing a book that you would write a book that would talk about the, how big a horse's balls are as part <laughs> of the book? <laughs> I'm just wondering if that was something that you'd always dreamed of I doing. I didn't think I would, but I, but I, I always hoped that I'd earn permission to go there. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> whether I have that or not is to be determined. But it's I, I, part of this because I uh, I work in an at- a lovely nexus of the mad world of advertising and needingly so academic field and rigorous field of behavioral science. So I sort of, as I, as I set off to achieve this, if, if someone can, if we can sort of push the envelope a little bit and bring into, bring, I'm not sure if Kahneman would write about a horse's ball. <laughs> so if I, can, I think if we I, could bet, we could bet, we on, can that bet on that one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, not putting myself, certainly not putting myself there, but it's, it's it, hopefully there's a good excuse to, to bring in some spaces and some ideas and some, some examples that may not typically make the, um, make the economist <laughs> but, but they're, welcome, they're, welcome, they're, welcome, they're welcome in my book and and if, if people are interested to understand the, the backstory have a look they, they have to buy the book i think this is a great <laughs> lead-in to say look if you want to understand why sam's writing about you know the size of a horse's balls you need to buy the book and, and, and read it so <laughs> it does um, make with, sense when you get into it but yeah it, it does oh, yeah, it's, totally. it's actually yep. it was an amazing yep. like insight i'm like going oh my gosh that is so cool to think yeah. that somebody again did they do that on purpose because of that reason i don't know but, but that was cool worth knowing so, certainly worth yeah. knowing because it, yes it extends beyond beyond the balls themselves <laughs> <laughs> oh sam as always always it is it is a pleasure talking with you oh, and thank you yeah thank you so much thank you it's uh, wonderful to connect again and uh, thanks so much for having me on the program Welcome to the Grooving Session, where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Sam, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever comes into our non-evolved brains, Tim. You know, most people have evolved ah, brains. You and me, not, us. Mm, not not so much. Sam has a really evolved brain. He is very like much so. Yep. way beyond the scope of anything that, that I could ever hope to uh, ascribe to. So, Yeah, agreed. You know, we can only hope to curate the kind of information and look at the world with such clever and thoughtful viewpoints. I don't know. I'm just grateful that I'm grateful that we get to talk to him and get to talk about his cool stuff. I am really grateful. He is such a insightful person, as you mentioned, but then the ideas in this book. And so I, again, I recommend for all of our listeners uh, to get the book. It's getting yeah. lots of really good, positive publicity out there across the board. It's going to be really fantastic for everybody. I think it's just really insightful. And I think that the ideas are ones that not only are insightful, but they are practical. They are useful. They are a way of looking at the world with through a different lens. And that different lens allows us to probably be have more evolutionary ideas, more creative ideas, come up with these solutions that we wouldn't have come up with or come up with them faster than we would have otherwise. Like the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, let's just go kill some birds. Well, it's, <laughs> it, it's you know, in the hierarchy of things, there was a part of it. It's like, well, lose one bird versus lose 30 people. Yeah. You know, 30 miners. I, but but uh, this, this idea, right? The idea of having a canary that can be a forewarner of... Yeah you know, deadly gases that are in there because the canary is evolved in a different way and takes in two breaths for every breath or whatever it is. I mean, yeah. that was just crazy, right? So Because they have to do- dose up on oxygen. A less lethal way of doing the same thing would be to ask for, you know, have the brown M&Ms removed from the M&M jar, right? Because then you get that, I'm paying attention. Yeah, you're rocking out already. You could just hear that Eddie Van Halen solo in your head. Yeah, and and I and, always thought that that the Van Halen was just just assholes about that. But this was I there was so a, there was a there was a madness or there was some element to their madness that made sense, and it wasn't necessarily just about being dicks. It was about saying, "All right, yeah. we need to pay attention. If the around M and Ms are there, we need to be paying attention to a whole bunch of other things that we yeah, when, don't when have Van, to." If they're, when Van Halen came on the scene, and I don't know if me being in the music community at the time sort of allowed me access to that information about the brown M&Ms earlier than anybody else. Whenever I, I got that, it was like reason number 57 why I hated them. Like I, I thought Eddie Van Halen's guitar playing was amazing, but I was like, oh God, David Lee Roth and those guys are like, oh, they're just such, they are just like such assholes, but they were incredibly driven, hardworking, committed artists in, in what they did, making pop music 
incredibly entertaining. So looking back on it, I was, you know, I was wrong to judge them so much, but yeah. the, okay. All this is back to the brown M&Ms is a great indicator of, are you paying attention? All right. I just have to make a, make a one little comment. I don't know if I would consider Van Halen pop music, but that's beside the point. There you go. More of a sugar, uh, man. It's more, all sugar in my yeah, mind. That is just that is saccharine. You know, oh, come on, they are they're on your anyway. All right, we can we we'll go there. <laughs> Let's just think about this from a different perspective. Let's think about this like we are remembering our experience with oh, with Van yeah. Halen, right? And and when we remember, that's a very different than the actual experiencing self that we have, yes. right? Yes. And it goes back to that concept that we all know in, in behavior science, that peak end rule, but it also is a very different way of thinking about things. things. With a lovely evolutionary base, right? Wow. The, the, the basis for this is we had to remember uh, 40,000 years ago if this was a place to get healthy food or food that would kill you or make you sick. We needed to remember that stuff. So sort of the peak end rule was really important. Uh, you know, did somebody die or did they live when they ate this food? Because that's kind of all that mattered. Yeah. So those wonderful first three days on the Titanic never get talked about, right? You only talk <laughs> oh, about those that. really bad ending. I don't understand why, you know. I know, man. Well, that first night's dinner was Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we never hear those stories. We never hear the stories about how delightful the band sounded the first night, you know, on the Titanic. No. no. <laughs> but that's but, but this is a really good thing. And this is this is one of those insights again that, you know, it's an evolutionary piece and how we, we do this. But I think it's really important for us to understand when we're thinking about the ideas that we have and and how are we forming them and, and doing this. Are we, are we, we're always looking back in order to inform, and that's different than how we experience things. And I think that's really key yeah. here. So, Mr. Houlihan, help me understand what biomimicry is. I know Sam did a wonderful job of explaining it, did. but how would you define biomimicry? I see biomimicry in the design of all kinds of things. I see it more in things than in processes, but that doesn't mean to say that we couldn't do that. You certainly talked about uh, Jorge early on uh, about the development of Velcro. So it's the development of a product that was inspired by something that already existed in the natural world. The, the train, the nose on the train, when it was designed to look more like a kingfisher, was much more successful at keeping the, the sonic booms down, those those big uh, and all, tunnel booms. Yeah, and all of those pieces yeah. of, of taking insights from the owl's feathers and how they're yeah. designed to reduce the, the vibrations and the sound and and all of those elements that we, we look at from that, the whale's fin and how that, you oh, know, the yeah. bumps on, on the different pieces of there. This idea of saying, hey, the nature has had 3.8 billion plus years of evolution. And that evolution means that something has survived or done well or now is adapted to the environment that we're in. Right. And we can take some of those insights, like the burrs, in being able to be sticky and yet being able to be peeled off, right? They're, they're sticky, they stay on, but you can peel them off. Velcro, my gosh, what a fantastic invention that was, yep. right? And so we can yep. take some of these insights. And too often, this is what I think Sam is talking about, is that too often we think about innovation. We think about creating new ideas and creativity as having to have that aha moment all on our own coming up with things. When in fact, we can probably look outside at nature or at things that have already been developed, maybe in different contexts or in different situations or in different settings, and then take those insights and apply them in new novel ways. That is the key thing here. Uh, agreed. Agreed. I, and we are missing out on so much by not paying attention to those things. And I think Triz 
does uh, a great job as a theory of inventive problem solving to lay out what these these 40 principles can be to actually stimulate some ideas for us that if that we could go to those categories and actually look at the categories and go well this you know the nested doll thing yeah. when 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 Sam was talking about uh, the nested doll is replicated in the way a nail polish you know, uh, brush an umbrella. Is, you know, all umbrella. of those pieces. They're they're different ways, and so applying those. And I, what I loved about Triz is that you know, there's 39 engineering parameters, and then those inventive principles, 40 inventive principles, right? And you you take a look at both of those, and you're going, all right, here's how this applies, and it applies to the engineering problems, but we can apply those or similar ways of thinking about things in the behavioral science world. And that is the piece, again, that I think Sam is bringing forth saying, let's take a look. What are those principles around behavioral science that we have that we can say, how do we look at human behavior? How do we look at how people will respond to this and then be able to apply the solutions around that and taking those into consideration as we're designing things? Yeah. I just want to end on something that really struck me as one of the coolest parts of our conversation. And that was about language and the way Sam framed language as the liberator of innovation. It sets innovation free by the language that we use, referencing the idea that Eskimos have 180 words to describe snow. They need that kind of specificity. It matters what kind of snow it is because it's going to, it impacts their lives on a daily basis. You know, I, I have a, a friend that spent a winter in Toxic Bay up in uh, Alaska, north of the Arctic Circle. And man, you care about the weather. You absolutely care about what the weather conditions are. So it's worth having 180 words around it. So physicists need to have words that are specific to them. Lawyers need to have words that are specific to their trade to help bring more specificity, specificity and clarity and understanding to what what they're exchanging, what when they're exchanging ideas. And that leads to better innovation, the better we use language. I love that. Yeah. And you know, you there's this element about specialized language sometimes as being exclusive, that you're doing it yeah. to keep yeah. others out. But the idea of this liberator of innovation, right, is is really interesting to me and it and better able to examine the situation and understand what's going on as well then as being able to communicate that with others so that you have a shared understanding of what this is. You're the musician here, right? When you think about Mm. words in music, like for tempo or how loud something is do you say it just it goes to 11 is that how the, you, you talk about it or yeah. or it's really fast it's let's just do fast or really slow is that how you describe that yeah no there's very specific words in the in the music language to describe loudness and softness and about like forte for loud and piano for you know for softer and you know mezzo for kind of in the middle and fortissimo for super loud and like these are all very specific of course they came from the italian realm but they all have have italian bases but those words matter right and they mean something pretty specific within the minds of musicians who are used to dealing with them and there's only five or six words but it's a lot more specific than just loud or soft and again, for, sure. for a person on the outside who doesn't have the musical training, you start talking yeah. mezzo yeah. or or fortissimo <laughs> or whatever it is that you talked about. I can't even pronounce the words. I don't understand that. But for you being a musician and being able to communicate with the other members of the band or of yeah. the orchestra, that is beneficial. And it's the same thing yes. when we think about business and the way that we think about communicating inside of business that sometimes we get really, you know, we use words that have no meaning, right? Or generalized to mean nothing or everything. And if you're a leader, if you're working in it, you need to be very thoughtful about the words that you use to draw attention to what is important. Yeah. I also see that in the way companies name their departments. We're seeing fewer organizations Talk about human resources or HR for shorthand, human resources. It feels like, what's a resource? You know, is this like materials? Is this like steel? 
or orange juice or, you know, what is it? We're human. Know? Yeah, they're human resources. We human just put resources. them on a, on, a, on, a, on a line and they go down the line. And yeah. We, yeah. And more organizations are adopting language like we're calling that department people experience. Because mm-hmm. that's really, it's both more descriptive and a little less brutal. Like talking about your prospects as targets, you know, what, what targets are you going after? Well, how about what potential clients are you going after? The language matters. It, it frames us. It, it frames the way we think about the world. Yeah. Well, and it primes us and we can go a whole you know, conversation on that. But let's, uh, let's go uh, again. Just a, one other piece of this is taking the ideas that Sam said. And, you know, he gives this example of exporting the raw materials for building refrigerators to different markets so the products can accommodate local differences. Oh, right. You know, right. that that idea as opposed to, you know, building a refrigerator and just expecting that it's going to be working across the globe when they have different power and different different pieces. Yeah. It's like, no, we need the parts and then the parts need to be unique. So yeah. why don't we do that for behavioral biases? You know, I think. Yeah. And we saw this. It reminds me of Channing Jang, right? When he was talking about doing the the public speaking tests in Nigeria, where the Europe. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. The Europeans and and Americans, like their cortisone levels go way up when they're asked to speak in front of experts. The Nigerians were like, okay, bunch of guys in white coats. First of all, I love public speaking. And anyway, why bring all the butchers into this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm talking to the local butcher group. You know, that's awesome. There you go. Yeah. And they're not experts. Yeah. No I, can, I can talk about that. It's, it's this idea, the weird component within behavioral yes, science yeah, and making yeah. sure that we understand there are unique differences between cultures, between areas of the world, even between, you know, different regions within those areas. And again, as we like to say, you know, context matters. So where did you come up with that? I wow. don't it's a it's a it's something I that, that you know, I, I'm sure it was an aha thing for me. I, <laughs> I didn't hear that anywhere else. And it was just, you know, my natural you know, IQ of oh, geniusness of, of coming up with something like that. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say context matters. <laughs> Kurt, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have gotten that from any anywhere else. But this, this, <laughs> I, this idea that we need to get more specific. And so that that specificity isn't a yeah. bad thing. It is a good thing. And we need to keep mm-hmm. doing that. So. Absolutely. All right. With that, Groovers, we want to wrap things up. We want to remind you that Sam's stories about biomimicry are meant to inspire you to do new and cool things, even if those ideas already exist, like context matters is maybe, (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Maybe you'll find yourself looking up some of those 40 inventive principles in Triz and applying a nested doll concept to your next kitchen gadget or whatever you're designing. At the very least, we hope you enjoyed our conversation with Sam and that we thank you for listening to Behavioral Grooves. Yes, thank you for listening. We have lots of cool episodes coming up, but I'm going to highlight just one and one that we have next week with the University of Chicago professor, John List, who went from the chief economist at Uber to Lyft and now is, I think, the chief behavioral economist at Walmart. And if you want to understand how to take an idea or a business and scale it up, well, not only do you want to understand biomimicry and where the ideas come from, but you want to be able to take those ideas and make them voltage, voltage them up. Listen, listen to our conversation with John because it is powerful and cool. But back to this episode, whatever you take away from our conversation with Sam, whether it be, you know, using owls as uh, good, you know, metaphors for, you know, how to design a train, uh, whatever that would be. We hope that it helps you go out and find your groove.